Hello. Thank you for joining on this, this powerful presentation on point to point to point to multi point. I'm Gabe Reyes and I'm the sales engineer here at Ingenious Technologies. Thank you for joining on this, this powerful presentation on point to point to point to multi point. Sorry, what? I'm Gabe Reyes and I'm the sales engineer here at Ingenious Technologies. Thank you for joining on this, this powerful presentation on point to point to point to multi point. I'm Gabe Reyes and I'm the sales engineer here at Ingenious Technologies. Sorry for that. Hang on a second. Okay, so um, if you guys can hear me, that should fix the echo issue, sorry about that. So without further ado, let's go into the point to point and point to multi point PowerPoint presentation. Uh, the reason why I like to do this presentation is because in wireless, there is, um, it's, it's a very niche type of field in knowledge, but the outdoor point to point is even more of a, of a niche type of knowledge. So it's very hard to find valuable information. And I've noticed that a lot of uh, people I help and the customers, they really like to do the, uh, the point to point, particularly certain vertical like security. And uh, so we want to make sure that we do a PowerPoint presentation that covers a lot of uh, stuff that you probably won't get elsewhere with the experience that I have. All right, so let's go over the agenda today. We're going to go over some partner benefits. Uh, the difference between point to point and point to multi point, uh, when to use point to point and point to multi point. Um, also, some considerations to take in your outdoor deployment, uh, backhaul deployment, which is Fresnel zone, uh, antenna type, channel width, and uh, frequency band, as well as the standard or non standard 811 considerations. And then we're going to go over some examples or one example of each, and then we're going to take your questions. Okay, so the partner benefits program, you find that at partners.ingeniustech.com. There's all these great benefits, and uh, we'd like to see you take advantage of these benefits, such as dealer pricing uh, for, for it, uh, easy Wi Fi planner, uh, access to certifications and trainings, as well as uh, access to this recording, which is uh, going to be behind there as well. Without further ado, let's start talking about a point to point. So, what is a point to point? Well, as the image shows on the top of point to point is you have two radios connecting to each other in the backhaul type of scenario. They can either be doing, uh, uh, let me see, standard to 11, they can be doing another type of protocol or something else which we'll talk about later. Uh, we have something called a root and a non root. So the root would be considered the one close to the demarcation point and the non root would be opposite to that. It's important to note that we have a, a one to one ratio. So as you can see in point to multi-point later on, you'll have different ratios of non-root to root. The benefits of having a point to point is there's one contention domain. There's no other radios contending for access to the medium. It's just two, two radios. It's easy to set up. Uh, you just have to worry about one uh, line of sight for no zone and only one, uh, you know, want to talk about beam widths, only one of that. So you get narrower beam widths. You have to calculate line of sights. a lot easier to do that. It's, um, dedicated throughput as well. So it's just like the top of the no contention. You're not sharing the capacity of the link across multiple, across multiple nodes. So an example of point to point would be just like this example, which we will come over, uh, we'll, we'll follow up with it later on in the, uh, in the PowerPoint presentation. This is actually uh, going across two state lines. We have the non root in the upper left hand corner. And then we have the root at the lower right hand corner. So they're going to send a, a signal from the lower right hand corner up into the upper left hand corner uh, for whatever they need. So let's talk about a point to multi point. So in a point to multi point, we actually have a several non roots to a root. 
In this particular example, we have a two to one ratio. So two non-roots to one root. I think it grow even more depending upon the capacity of the link. You could do three to one, four to one, five to one. It could go even higher. Um, the benefit of, of having a point to multi-point is lower equipment cost. In the example right now, if you we were to do point to points, we would have two point to points and it would require four sets of radios. In the point to multi-point, we actually have uh, just three radios, but as the ratio gets bigger and bigger, like a four to four to five, the ratio actually gets, uh, you know, the ratio gets bigger, the amount of equipment gets smaller. So let's say we have a four to four. Well, then that would mean we would need eight radios as opposed to only five radios. They're, uh, they're good for lower, uh, sorry, they're good, good for low to moderate network demands. And we'll go over uh, why that is uh, later. So basically you have a certain network capacity and you're spreading it across multiple root nodes. And so if you need something that has greater capacity, you'll need to be able to shrink the ratio, maybe even bring it to point to point. So here's an example of a point to multi-point, which we did in, uh, in, in the Seattle area. It is a condominium complex, and we were actually uh, replacing another vendor that was, uh, that was mesh, and uh, we replaced it with uh, WDS bridge links for our in-station ACs. In this example, we have the root in REC building one in the top or right-hand corner, and then we have the building Q, P, and N, which are gonna be the non-roots, and they have cameras on them as well. So the in-station AC is a 30 degree beam width, which we'll talk about later on. But as you could see here, the between building Q, uh, P and N and rec building one, that's actually a 90 degree uh, arc there. And you'll see the reasons why we're able to get, get away with that. But this is an example of a point to multi-point. This will be a three to one ratio. Okay, so now we're getting into choosing why we choose a point to point or a point to multi point. The biggest, biggest, biggest reason is based upon the application uh, network metric requirements. This sounds like a lot of nothing, but it really means what is the application going down the network and how do I design appropriately for that application? For example, if I were using something that is very latency sensitive, such as real time applications, such as terminal software, uh, telnet, PTZ cameras, uh, security access controls, uh, or VoIP, I would actually most likely lean towards a point-to-point -point type of deployment for those because those actually are very latency sensitive. They need access to the medium as quick as they can. They can't, they don't want to have the time to sit around and wait for contention. Things that are not latency sensitive, uh, such as IP cameras, file transfers, streaming movies, I'll mostly do that as a point-to-multi-point so long as the capacity doesn't, ex sorry, so long as the load doesn't see the capacity I have to give to them. Uh, project budget is also a big thing. Uh, remember I talked about earlier, a point to multi-point. As you start getting the ratios higher, it gives you more of a cost savings per, uh, per the devices. That would be one, way, one reason why you go to point to point to multi-point over point to point. The non-root non -root count. Um, if I have a lot of non-roots, it may be more beneficial for me to go point to multi-point as opposed to point to point due to the cost of that and the channel reuse and the, uh, the amount of space that I have to mount the antennas. Uh, line of sight limitations. Uh, let's say for example, if I want to go around the building, well then I'll have two point to points as opposed to maybe, uh, maybe three point to points as opposed to just one. Or uh, let's say I have a tree in the way. And so if the tree's in the way between two nodes and that may cause uh, you know, Fresnel's own blockage, I may do two point to points. Or let's say I want to connect to multiple devices in a row and uh, for them to be stacked on a, on, a, on a tower for the roots would be too close to each other. I would do a point to multi-point in that, in that situation. That would be one of the mounting uh, location limits as well, which is the physical space you have to mount them on, as well as access to the power and easements rights to mount them, uh, aesthetics. Uh, some people, sometimes people don't like to see antennas and then also the antenna height limits. Sometimes you're limited on how high you can mount these uh, antennas due to the regulatory, uh, whatever in your regulatory domain you have. Uh, also, you have antenna beam width restraints as well. Um, one thing I want to touch on that for beam width restraints right now, I want you to know is that the general rule of thumb is that the wider the beam width, the, uh, the less range you're going to get from the antenna, and the narrower the beam width, the greater the range you're going to get. There's also other benefits too, which we'll go over in later slides. Now we're going to talk about the Fresnel zone consideration. Uh, basically, this is also known as minimum antenna height. It's actually the RF line of sight requirement. There's only two variables that impact this equation. The equation's on the right-hand side, and it is distance and frequency dependent. 
So that means that this equation outcome will be dependent upon the distance or the frequency. So when I'm planning a link and I have to think about RF line of sight requirements or Fresnel zone requirements, the only two things I have to really worry about is the distance and the frequency that these two are operating on. So uh, when it says minimum antenna height, it means the minimum height has to be above any obstacle for it to be unobstructed. Now, it could be obstructed, uh, rule of thumb is 30 to 40%, depending upon the whatever you're doing on the network. Um, I like to plan for 100%, and then uh, from there you have reality, and you can start seeing how much you could get with the obstruction itself. But if you could get 100% unobstructed in, in the real world, then I would say go for that as much as you can. The reason for that is because of the image in the bottom, you could see that there's an obstruction within this Fresnel zone, and you see FZ1 and FZ2. FV1 stands for the first Fresnel zone, which we're the ones interested in, and FV2, which is the second Fresnel zone, which is one we're not really that interested in. So when you have an obstruction in the primary Fresnel zone, Fresnel zone one, uh, the radio waves, they bounce off the obstruction, maybe they get absorbed. So they come back in a way that you can't predict in different angles. They come back with different amplitudes and different phases of the actual uh, wave. So when waves interact with each other, there's only three things they could do. They could either do something which we call constructive interference, which is they'll actually give you an application of the signal beyond the FSPL, which is called free space path loss, which we'll go into that uh, after, after, afterwards. We have destructive interference, which is signal loss over FSPL. And then we have nullification, which basically they just cancel each other out. So of those three options, there is two that's undesirable and the one that is desirable. So as the obstruction starts obstructing more of your Fresnel zone, you actually start getting a higher chance of those two things happening as opposed to the one, the two you don't want. Uh, for free space path loss, that's basically an equation that we have to uh, calculate the amount of RF loss you're gonna get over, over open air. So um, when I say amplification, I'm not gonna, I'm, not saying it's going to be more signal than what's going to come from the antenna. It's just more signal there than what you're going to calculate in FSPL. That's what I, I mean by that. So I'm trying not to confuse you there. Uh, fixes for obstructions would be to mount the antennas higher if possible, uh, move the antennas closer if that's possible, or you could move to a, a different frequency as well. Uh, so the rule of thumb is for the lower frequencies, such as 2.4 gigahertz, you'll have a larger Fresnel zone. For higher frequencies, such as 5 gigahertz, 11 gigahertz, 60 gigahertz, 28 gigahertz, those have a uh, smaller Fresnel zone because the frequency gives you a smaller Fresnel zone. So one thing, also things to take into consideration for Fresnel zone is foliage changes. Uh, for example, this tree in the bottom left hand uh, of the slide, let's say I deploy it during the winter and I get great signal strength. And uh, let's say spring and summer come around, well then the leaves start growing on the tree. And what happens is the link may become marginal or may be unusable at that point. And at that point, I have to take the, the tree into consideration for Fresnel zone. So that's obviously something you might wanna you know, have a look in before you deploy to make sure you do the proper calculations to take that into consideration. High profile vehicles, you're also gonna be impacting your, uh, your RF signal. Uh, for example, I had a customer that wanted, had gas pumps on the far end of his gas station and he was servicing um, semi-trucks and he had his antennas mounted about six feet above the ground. And that was good for cars or for SUVs, but for semi-trucks, they could be up to 14 feet high. And depending whether they're carrying metal or if they're insulated, um, you know, trailers that have more insulation in them and they attenuate the signal more, they're actually caused, when they would pull in, they actually caused the pumps to no longer operate. So the fix for that was to just move the non-root antennas up into the roof line of the, of whatever easement was atop of that, which was like 20 something feet high to get above those uh, high profile vehicles. Also got to take into account if you're doing backhauls in RV parks, those RVs have different heights. You don't want an RV to drive through and block your signal, block that link. Ground topology, different, uh, different elevations of the ground. Uh, you have to take that into account. So if I have one lower, one higher, I may have to raise the lower one higher, uh, you know, in order to block it from being put the ground blocking the signal. That's also something to take into consideration. Uh, building clearances, uh, obviously you, 
some you're not going to shoot through buildings depending on the density of the buildings so if you're in a high-rise downtown area you may want to shoot it uh, you want to shoot in between buildings you want to make sure that the fresnel zone is going to be um, clear uh, around the buildings uh, one thing i also note about the equation in the previous slide was that 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 uh, calculates the radius. As you can see in the upper right hand, there's an R. That means if you want to calculate the full Fresnel zone, you just double that and they'll give you the diameter. So that's also something to take consideration. And since it's uh, isotropic, it's three dimensional, it is not only up and down, but it's also left and right clearance you need as well. And blockage of the Fresnel zone is additive. So if I have a tree in one area, a tree in another area, a tree in another area, all that will add together to block the Fresnel zone. Uh, also want to take it to bridges and overpasses to considerations. If I want to shoot over uh, a bridge, I also have to take into consideration the traffic going over the bridge, making sure that a high profile vehicle is not going to block that link through there. So uh, let's take one example for Fresnel zones uh, considerations. I had a customer that was deploying a security camera and access control system at the end of a 300 foot driveway. Um, it was in the Las Vegas area. He had large older magnolia trees lining his driveway. And it looked nice, uh, but the thing is that the trees were additively blocking the Fresnel zone. So one tree in itself was not enough to block it, but tree after tree after tree was enough to block it. So the choices were to raise the antennas above the trees or to, uh, or to uh, mount the uh, radios closer or to, uh, or to change the frequency. We actually were not able to mount it higher or trim the trees. We weren't able to do that type of stuff. So what he did was he actually decided to go to a higher frequency to a narrower Fresnel zone to get, to, to get, get around that, uh, those trees. Um, we did have to trim the trees a little bit because even with the smaller Fresnel zone, when the trees blew in the wind, they did block it momentarily, which could cause operational problems. So they had to trim it as well, but not as much as they would if they did a lower frequency. So let's talk about antenna type considerations. So we just talked about Fresnel zone consideration for RF uh, line of sight, but also the antenna type you choose is also very important as well. Now it's important to note that the antenna beam width is not going to impact the Fresnel zone. So if I get a, uh, let's say the sector antenna 90 degrees and I get a dish, it's not gonna mean that I have a, you know, I have a smaller Fresnel zone with a dish as opposed to the sector. The Fresnel zone is still the Fresnel zone. It's just my ability to hear interference or focus on my RF energy in a particular area that's gonna be benefiting. So um, as you can see here, the ones with the, um, the antennas with the greater coverage is gonna have less uh, out, less gains, less output power, less range. The one with smaller coverage is gonna have greater output power, I'm sorry, greater focusing. So EIRP will be higher, you'll get greater range from there. Uh, for example, to read a polar plot, that's what's on the bottom here of an antenna. I would say the azimuth is the top down view. So this particular antenna, uh, just a rough estimate, is about 30 to 35 degrees for the primary beam width. And then for the, for the vertical uh, beam width, which is shown in the elevation, which is the side view of the antenna that gives you up and down beam width, uh, that would say it's about five to 10 degrees. So it's pretty narrow in the vertical and it's pretty wide in the horizontal. So if I were to be mounting this on a pole in an RV park, I'd probably have a down to, to that because of the uh, such a because the vertical beam width is so narrow. So one thing to take into consideration for designing for beam width is in the same point to multi-point example we showed earlier with a 30 degree beam width on the NCHN AC, it doesn't work if you try to expand it, like let's say to build an H in this example. So building H, even though it is let's say a little bit further off than building Q, it's further away. So the antenna is not able to hear uh, building H non-root and that will give you a, either a poor link quality or no link quality or sub suboptimal considering whatever network load you're gonna be placing on the network. So that's one thing to also take into consideration. Okay, so this is a very wordy slide, but basically the, uh, the gist of it is you need to make sure the antennas are separated physically um, for, so you don't interfere with each other. So uh, if the lower frequencies need greater separation to the antennas and also higher frequencies need less separation. Also output power comes into play as well. If I have a higher output power and a higher frequencies, I need to make sure I need to separate it more than if it was on lower output power because they're able to hear each other. So rule of thumb is five gigahertz is three to five feet and 2.4 is about seven to 10 feet of separation. 
And this is vertically uh, and, and horizontally um, because it's isotropic. Uh, for example, in the upper left-hand corner of those two end station ACs that are like back to back, if one's on channel 161 on the left-hand side and channel 36 on the right-hand side, what I will uh, experience if I have a protocol analyzer, it'll actually see packets for 161 show up on channel 36 because they're so physically close to each other. There's no rejection from the attenuation of the airspace. And so basically they end up being co-channel interference. And so that means that whatever's going on one side impacts the other side. And so in order to get around that, you have to have separation. Now it's important to note that if I had a, a pole and I have multiple links to go out to, I may have to, um, even though it calls for point to point connection, I may have to go to point to multi-point connections because of the physical limitations I have on the pole to mount to. Okay, now let's talk about channel width considerations. This is also an important topic as well. So um, a lot of times people like to deploy wireless backhauls with the fattest channel with the highest output power. And uh, that ne may necessarily not be the best way to, to be deploying uh, because you're gonna be increasing the noise level and then also you're exposing yourself to a, um, a lot more interference or high statistical chance of interference. So for transmit channel with considerations, the benefits are if you use a wider channel, in this example, we're using Uni1 and the 80 megahertz channel because each channel is a 20 megahertz separation on the center, center channel. So 80 would be a bonding of those, of those four 20s. It would be, it would be uh, increase the throughput from a single frame. Now that's given that the environment is low, uh, you know, low contention. Uh, it's not really good for real-time traffic because you're aggregating multiple frames and real-time traffic needs to have the frame sense when, when it transmits. So if you're aggregating them, you're introducing a latency and that is not beneficial for real-time traffic, such as a uh, VoIP. Uh, there's less management overhead per frame in a low RF condition environment. So if I send multiple frames at a time, I don't. I only receive one acknowledgement for multiple frames as opposed to sending, as opposed to having one acknowledgement per frame. So that benefits the, the efficiency of the medium as well in the, in the low RF contention environment. The cons is not ideal for real-time traffic. We talked about uh, that. Uh, more overhead in high RF contention environment. Um, as, as I'll talk about that later. And RF energy is spread over a greater uh, frequency area or surface area for a non-technical term. So that means as I'm taking the same RF energy, I'm spreading across more frequencies. I'm actually decreasing the amount of output power I could put on that radio because the SEC limits me to how much I could actually output. So that means that I, I, if I take the same output power and it cannot change spread across more frequencies, that means effectively I'll have less, less output power which is not good for higher data rates, you need a higher signal to noise ratio, so you're lowering your, your signal ratios. So um, let's say, for example, I have interference on channel 48. Uh, for standard Wi-Fi channels, there's 20, 40, and 80 for AC. So let's say I have interference on channel 48. Well, then I got to drop back to 40 megahertz. That means I'm only using channel 36 and 40, which 44 is being unused at this time. If I experience interference on channel 40, that means I got to drop back to a 20 megahertz channel. And that means I'm only using channel 36 at this particular time. So in that, in th that case, in a high contention environment, you're actually hurting yourself by using wider channels than by more narrow channels. I like to view it as like, a, I like to have an analogy of a log. Uh, let's say I have a log and I'm trying to send it through an obstacle course, uh, the swinging uh, punching bags. And if the rule is, if the log is, uh, you know, if a punching bag touches the log, signifies interference, I gotta, I gotta start the log back at point zero and try the whole log again. So as you can see, as I try doing that with wider channels in a high contention environment, I have less statistical chance of getting that data where it needs to go, introducing more latency and loss. So a better way of doing this would be to um, fragment, not to, not, to, uh, not to aggregate in order to get real-time traffic through. So if I break up the logs into smaller pieces and I throw them through the obstacle course, I have a greater chance of getting more pieces of the logs through than trying to get the whole log through at one particular time. And that's where, uh, that's where we have uh, you know, fragmentation benefiting us for real-time traffic over aggregation. So even the type of traffic you send through, you need to take into consideration the traffic type and why, to, uh, why you want to use narrow channels over, over wider channels. So here's the transmit uh, consideration to a narrow channel. You have RF energy spread across less frequency space, 
So that means that basically you have the same amount of energy spread across a less surface area, you have a higher signal processing on that one. It's ideal for real-time traffic as the analogy with the log. So if I have any uh, uh, interference, I'm actually uh, able to avoid the interference more by doing so a channel that may not experience that much interference is trying to bond across all of them. Uh, less overhead in high RF condition environments. The only th uh, drawback to this is that I, uh, I, uh, less throughput is carried per frame. But I also have to take consideration the receive sensitivity as well, or the, re the receive considerations on a wider and a smaller channel. So signified here with the ear um, as the, let's say this is the uh, radio and it has a 80 megahertz channel it's listening to, I'm listening to a lot of different things that are either Wi-Fi or non-Wi-Fi. That means I'm raising the noise level, which is indicative of the uh, thermometer in the left-hand side. So I have a bigger, fatter channel, but if I have more noise and if the signal is less because I'm spreading across more, uh, more frequencies, that means I have a smaller signal to noise ratio, which means I'm maybe not be able to maintain high data rates as effectively if I use uh, smaller channels. So that's the reason why we like to use uh, smaller channels for outdoor uh, deployments, as well as lower output power, the lowest power you could get away with. Here's uh, what would happen if I listen to a smaller channel, like a 20 megahertz as opposed to an 80. I'm actually rejecting um, interference on other frequencies, not listening to them, ignoring them, and only listening to what I need to listen to. So this is also the similar what I get if I use a directional antenna. If I use an omnidirectional antenna, I'm able to hear in all directions and be able to hear all the interference. If I have a directional antenna, I'm actually focusing my ability here in one area and deafening my ability here in other areas. And so that increases, that lowers the signal, sorry, lowers the noise level and it allows me to hear the signal better. So if I couple this with a, uh, with a smaller channel width and a smaller antenna beam width, and I'm actually able to go even further. So the, the argument is I'm able to send little bits of information quicker, more efficiently, then I am able to send a larger bit of information less frequently. That's the argument here. Okay, let's talk about frequency considerations as well. Remember in the Fresnel zone um, considerations uh, for the actual RF line of sight, it was uh, distance and frequency dependent. So we're in that particular scenario, you choose the frequencies based upon your RF line of sight. In this scenario, we choose different frequencies uh, based upon its capacity to carry or interference as well to try to avoid interference. So uh, the main reason why we have uh, higher frequencies and lower frequencies, why the higher frequencies attenuates uh, more than the lower frequencies is because you have the same uh, you know, linear distance to go, but you have a different path distance uh, because wavelength and frequencies are inversely related. The smaller the wavelength, the higher the frequency. The longer the wavelength, the lower the frequency. And so the car on the top is a higher frequency. You could tell it makes a lot more turns in the same 100 linear feet of road than the lower frequency car. It's doing less turns. And so um, if I read the odometer, the car at the top would have a greater path distance than the one at the bottom. If I were to read the gas tank as well, that means the one at the top would have less gas as it reaches the destination than the car in the bottom. And that's the reason why lower frequencies um, travel further is because they have more amplitude because they have a longer wavelength. It's also important to note that most of the time, lower frequencies have less capacity to carry traffic, but they do give you greater range. So uh, we're talking about frequency considerations as well. One of the things is how am I able to get uh, lots of RF communication technology communicating in kind of close proximity, but not too close with the cause interference, sorry, with each other. Uh, we do that through uh, frequency separation. And within the frequency separation, and uh, as you say, let's say we have uh, AO211 AF, that's done at 54 through 790 megahertz. Well, as you can see in the airplane representation, that's at the lower frequencies. So imagine airplanes flying through airspace, how multiple airplanes are able to occupy airspace. Sometimes the same column of airspace is that they're done at different elevations. Same thing with RF frequencies as well. And within the RF frequencies, they could be even further subdivided within different channels. For example, 2.4, you have three non-overlapping channels, one, six, and 11. And five gigahertz, you have multiple uh, non-overlapping channels to choose from. So that's how we're able to get multiple devices operating in closer proximity to each other just through frequency separation. So now we're gonna talk about the actual communication type. Uh, we have standard U211 and non-standard U211 uh, 
uh, considerations taken to, into account. So for the example in the upper left-hand column, or uh, sorry, corner, we have a TV and we have an infrared link for the remote control. Now that works great if you have RF line of sight. Now let's say someone walks in between you and the remote. Well, then you won't, you'll lose the ability to control the TV. So one way around that is to use a frequency that's lower than infrared. Let's say you're using 90 megahertz or something around that line, even 2.4 gigahertz. Well, then that means if someone walks through it, you can still get through them. They still have RF line of sight. You're still able to control the TV. Uh, we also have a smoke signal on the, uh, the right-hand side. And uh, let's say I want to communicate with smoke signals. Well, in there's certain situations that may not be appropriate. For example, if it's, a, if it's at night, it may be better to use light signals as opposed to smoke signals. Let's say it's a foggy day. It may be more appropriate to use fog horns as opposed to, uh, as opposed to smoke signals. The same thing happens with the type of communication under the wires. For example, in the bottom left-hand side, we have the standard arbitration logic for the uh, CSMA C8 we have for standard A211. Now, this is good for devices that need unscheduled access to the medium in a low uh, contending environment. If there's low contention and you need uh, unscheduled access to the medium, such as for real-time traffic, then that may, be good. that may be an appropriate uh, use case for that particular type of technology. But let's say you have a high contention environment and you really don't have a uh, to, uh, sorry, network traffic type that needs unscheduled access to the medium, then you would use something like TDMA, which is on the lower right-hand corner. And that divides it into time slots. And that means if you have something that's time sensitive, it has to wait for a time slot that may negatively impact that application. But if you don't have that type of application running on the network, then that may be an appropriate type of communication medium to use if it's a high contention. So uh, also you could, the mesh is involved in here as well. I didn't, I didn't include a picture of it, but it, we talked about it in the previous uh, PowerPoint presentation. If you're interested, you can go view that as well under the partner program, the partner portal. All right, so let's start talking about examples of uh, point to point and uh, point to multipoint. So this is a point to point example. We talked about it earlier in the, in the slide deck. Uh, we talked about the, the root being down in the lower right hand side and the non root being in the upper uh, left hand side. So in this case, we're actually going over a freeway. We're actually uh, going across different states as well. And so we have some certain challenges to this and we have certain requirements for the link. The link requirements are, we're going about 1.5 miles or connecting two separate buildings together. Uh, they're light network traffic. They're not really bandwidth intensive or latency sensitive type of traffic, which is good, uh, which is good for the link. The challenges are we have line of sight challenges and uh, maybe some RF interference challenges. Uh, for example, if airplanes follow this path down to a local airport, you may not want not want to deploy in DFS because that may impact your DFS. Um, if you have a holding pattern for an airplane, that may change its normal pattern that may impact your DFS as well. Uh, we also have overpasses for freeways, as you could see uh, right here. You have tall buildings too in the way that are right here. It's a good thing that these are located in a lower valley. Uh, there's there's a valley that comes down and it's like a bowl like this. And so that's how the topology actually looks like. So we're lucky that we have two buildings on the, on the top of the crest of these hills. And so you have good uh, you know, Fresnel zone clearance to go to them. Okay. So this is gonna be an image that we got from Google Earth. Uh, so the top one will be the root point of view down to the non-root, and the bottom one is the non-root to the root point of view. You can see there's got some trees in the way, but considering uh, the, the height of the secondary building and the ground topology, it's, you got some other buildings too in the way, you got like the, the train depot station too. It's not really going to be that much of a, of a big deal. And the root one also is on a higher elevation roof than the, the, than the other roof, which is at a lower elevation. So uh, we, we did the Fresnel zone calculations here and it ended up, being, uh, ended up being fine. He was all clear to use five gigahertz. So we ended up using five gigahertz for this one. Okay, let's start talking about point to multipoint example. Okay, so in this example, we have a, a top down view and this, it was condominiums and they also have um, security cameras to be aware of. So we have IP camera traffic coming down here. They're doing single stream to an NVR. They're not 
doing any monitoring. So we don't have to worry about, uh, you know, throughput stacking, which you have to worry about uh, dual streams or, or, or triple streams. So that's good. It's a moderate network load because some cameras have higher megapixels than others because they want license plate recognitions. So some links need point to point due to the uh, higher requirement of the camera and some will point to multi-point because they're lower cameras there, uh, lower megapixel cameras. So the challenges is uh, line of sight challenges. Uh, we'll see in the 3D image that we do have some line of sight challenges, not quite evident as a top-down view from here. There's link capacity challenges. Uh, as we talked about that, there were some cameras that had a little bit more uh, traffic going through them and they were on certain edges of them, so they're aggregating. Uh, mounting locations, we didn't have access to all these buildings. Not all buildings had a closet that we could have power to it. And then uh, possible RF challenges, which we'll show you in the 3D image uh, coming up. So this is the same. Uh, this is the same deployment, just in a different view. So now we're viewing it from the north to south, not a top-down view. And as you can see, we have certain line of sight requirements, as I was talking about earlier. For example, I can't do a, a, a straight point-to-point -point between Building Four and Building 18 because we have this building right here, which is Building A in the middle. So we have to go around that building. So that wasn't quite evident in the satellite view, but if you take a uh, bird's eye view, you can see that more. We also have um, possible RF challenges due to the stadium that's on the right-hand side. So uh, stadiums, what normally happens is that if the roof opens and they have some football games and they have some blimps flying overhead, the blimps have to have some navigation radios that operate in five gigahertz. And so, when you deploy this, it may not have any DFS events, but when you have the event going on and that blip is introduced, then you may have DFS events and your links will possibly go down. That's one thing to take into consideration. Also, um, when you have large uh, venues like this, a lot of people gather there and the local cell phone company may not have enough capacity on the cell phone tower to handle that. So they supplement it by trucking in mobile cell phone towers. Most of the time when they do that, they're using unlicensed spectrum called LTEU, which is most in the five gigahertz. And uh, when they do that, you also have more interference because it's raising the noise floor on those particular uh, levels. So if you have any five gigahertz links, may actually increase the noise level and may actually negatively impact your link there. So uh, in this case, we actually used a, a hybrid type of uh, solution of point to point, point to multi-point, as well as a different uh, frequency across different links to try to get around that, around the source of RF interference. One other thing I want to point out uh, here is that we have a, a building, sorry about that, we have a building. And uh, one of the buildings, like the one I circled in, uh, in building A, is that it has, a, uh, it has an elevator shaft on the roof. And so one thing you could do in that particular scenario, which I have experience on, is if you have antennas and they need to be pretty close to each other and you have an obstacle, a really high intensity obstacle, such as the elevator shaft on the roof, try to utilize that to the best of your ability. So if you have four sides, you're able to mount antennas on each side. And if the antennas don't really have that great of a beam width, you could, you could, actually, um, sorry, you could actually get a situation in which you could actually have uh, them on the same channel. So let me draw it out right here. So we have a building, we have an elevator shaft coming here. We have a radio on the left-hand side, and then we have a radio on the right-hand side. So what would happen is that this uh, structure right here is attenuated enough where I can actually have them on the same channel and they're not gonna be able to hear each other. Even though normally they would, in this case, they're not because the opposite was blocking them. So those are some tricks you could use, you know, use in order to try to get the best uh, deployment you can. So you can use structures to your benefit in this case. Okay, so now we're going to go over to the, uh, to the questions here. Sorry about that. And we could talk about this. Okay, so hang on a quick second. A little minor difficulties there. We're gonna go to question. Let's so answer some questions here. Okay, we got some questions here. Um, we got questions on how they can have uh, access to the slide deck. Uh, you can have access to the slide deck if you email uh, partners at in ingeniustech.com and uh, we'll be happy to send you the slide deck. You can also have a recording if you're a registered partner in the partner program, as, uh, sorry, partner portal as well. Well, thank you, that, that's, a, that's a good question. 
Okay, we have another question here. A question about, uh, let me see, the beam width. So uh, yeah, um, the beam width, when I was talking about is the, uh, the primary beam width. How they measure that is they basically, uh, they put the antenna into an RF shielded chamber and they, they grab a receiving uh, radio. And what they do is they go around and they determine where the, where the highest signal level they're getting on the, on the vertical axis and the horizontal axis. So on the horizontal axis, they find the point which is the strongest and they move certain degrees to the left or right. And when they mark the, when it goes down by 3 dB, they mark that as the primary beam width. And that would be your horizontal beam width. As you're going up and down in that axis, that would be marking your vertical beam width. And that is only 3 dB down, which means your other steps you have down are multiples of three. So the next step down of your primary beam width will be uh, six, nine, and 12, and so forth. So that's the reason why in the point to point type of deployment, when I had something that was 90 degrees off from the primary beam width, I was still able to make a connection because it, yes, it's 90 degrees off from the primary beam width, but maybe it's only 6 dB down. So if it's so close, let's say it's signal strength in the primary beam width would be negative 50, but because it's off, it's negative 56. That's still a strong signal. You still will make a really solid connection to that. And that's the reason why that will work. But if it's too far, if it's far enough away, that may not work because of the distance and you're off the primary beam. But thank you for that question. We have another question that is asking, um, asking how many bridge jumps are possible, bridge to bridge and bridge to camera. Um, we recommend normally three, but I've seen customers do as much as seven. <laughs> it all depends uh, when it goes back to the argument of network load and network capacity. If the network load does not exceed the network capacity, well, then you could go as, as far as the network capacity could take you and the network load would be there before you notice it. So that would be the, 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 the real world answer to that. But we like to just keep it to three. Um, we actually seen uh, camera traffic is mostly unidirectional and uh, that actually survives in some pretty bad environments. I've had someone that had a, uh, uh, a, a cable that was not, that was just there to have some crosstalk in the cable. And so the latencies were very high. They were only complaining about the PTZ camera at the end of this seven leg hop because the camera was showing on and offline on the NVR. Other than that, all the other cameras are operating just fine. They're standard uh, CMOS cameras. They're pushing traffic just fine. And he saw no frame droppage. So even though he did have crosstalk on his actual physical cable, he did not even notice the performance uh, problem of it because the application never exceeded, never required that much capacity. As, his point, as, as PTZ required two ways, other cameras were just one way. So hopefully that, uh, that answers that question. So the next question is how can you calculate uh, data slash antenna needs with multiple cameras? Well, um, what you wanna do is you wanna see what, what, what the total throughput requirement is of the camera. That's the actual camera pushing traffic. Also, if it's a PTZ camera, you have to take it to the latency as well. There's latency of, um, you know, requirements as well as that, especially if you have something like audio on the camera, that increases latency requirement as well. So once you know the metrics, then you could just use the metrics, uh, use a test like, uh, like Thomas off throughput test or something. And you could start, uh, you know, when you have the throughput, when you, sorry, when you have the point to point or point to multi-point link set up, you can start pushing traffic through and testing it like that. Um, or you could start, you know, having rough estimates and seeing how much a camera could push through. For example, if I do a 20 megahertz channel and two by two, I'm estimating about 90 to 100 megabits a second of TCP traffic. Uh, so I have a camera, I want the camera to be pulling no more than 50 or 60 megabits at a time. I wanna have a little bit of a buffer there. So just in case something happens like rain or something like that, get rain fade, I'm still able to still meet the requirements of the application that's running down the network. So that's a good question. Thank you for that. Okay, um, does the rotation of the, uh, sorry, does the rotation of the dish point to point impact the signal? Yes, it does, because that would have to go into the beam, uh, the beam with uh, conversation I had earlier. So if you are going off the primary beam with it going onto a side lobe, then obviously you're, you're going off the, of what the focus is and you go into like a, like, a, like a side lobe, which is going to have, you know, you know 
you're going to be have less signal than you normally would if you aligned it properly. Uh, one thing to take consideration for this as well is if I have ice built up on the antennas, that could negatively impact it. Uh, if I mount it to something that has a lot of uh, wind load, uh, that could impact it too because the wind is blowing it around. And if the if beam width is small enough, that actually could be enough to cause the link to go down. So those are things you might want to take consideration for longer point-to-point -point links as well. Uh, there's one that uh, says, let me, sorry about that. So we have another one uh, that says my, uh, let me see. If there is a cell tower on site, should you use five gigahertz 2.4 for IP cameras? Well, if there's a cell phone tower on site, and obviously that's a good question because it could be using uh, LTEU in the five gigahertz spectrum. Uh, and, the, and what they do is they say they use some protection mechanisms on the cell phone side, but the cell phones were designed to be on a licensed spectrum. So they kind of have, uh, they're not very, um, they're not very friendly when it comes to other competing uh, things in the area. I would say you actually could use a different frequency beyond that if it's determined that the cell phone is the problem. I've actually seen cell phones cause problems in the 2.4 gigahertz. It's the way they map the information. 2.4 maps the information more towards the amplitude of the wave. And five gigahertz maps the information more towards the change of the wave, which is phase. And uh, when I map information to the phase of the wave as opposed to the amplitude, I have more um, noise resiliency. Uh, for example, if I was in a concert and no one was around, I could talk to you and you would hear me no problem. But if there was people around and there's a concert going on, the music's blasting, I could be screaming in your face six inches and you're not able to hear me. So 2.4 maps it towards amplitude, you get that problem, which if you have too much noise, you lose basically what it maps it to, you lose that and you lose a lot of, a lot of bits and data. And so if I were to communicate you through a sign language, uh, then I'm able to communicate with you even in a noisy environment. And that's the equivalent of what five gigahertz does. It maps the information towards the phase of the wave. So I don't have to tell the amplitude, I could just tell whether the wave changes or not, and I could, deter I could map information to that. That's why um, five gigahertz is better for noise resiliency in that, in that particular environment. I recommend you get a, a, a spectrum analyzer and you uh, examine the environment and determine whether or not it actually, a nearby cell phone tower is actually increasing your channel util utilization. And from there, I would take multiple um, measurements because when you take a measurement, it's only a snapshot in time. I would take multiple snapshots and determine uh, if it's best or not to be deploying that particular frequency. You may even have to go to different frequencies too, like 11 gigahertz or 28 gigahertz or 60 gigahertz. I think 28 or 24 gigahertz is unlicensed. And then 11 gigahertz is lightly licensed and 60 gigahertz is, um, is also lightly licensed as well. And some cell phone towers do use 60 gigahertz as a, as a, as a point to point connection between the towers if they're close enough. Okay, that's a good, great question. Thank you for that. Uh, so I have another question that says, my building contains a chain where one non-root feeds the next root extending to the non-root. So you have multiple points, points. Uh, two radios facing 180 degrees on different channels. So it was like the example we had there where they're, hopefully they're physically spaced apart. Uh, my chain is three hops long. Uh, what needs to be considered with two radios close together in opposite directions on two different channels, how to optimize? Uh, the best way to optimize that is to just separate them either vertically or horizontally. So separate them. Uh, depending upon the frequency, if it was 2.4, maybe five to seven feet vertically from each other or, or, or horizontally, if that's possible. So if you see, um, uh, if you've seen telephone poles, uh, they have something called guide arms where their arms that stick out of the pole. That's how you would separate antennas horizontally. So you could be limited in your vertical uh, separation, but you could still separate it in your horizontal separation of that way if that's not too, uh, you know, visually intrusive to, to the deployment. So I would say the best thing to do in this case would be to actually physically separate the radios. So they, they do actually, and actually you already have them in different channels, but physically separate them, use the smallest channel you could get away with, and you could go from there. One thing I didn't talk about here, which um, probably is consideration in the security deployment is uh, you wanna do a tree and branch uh, type of design. So the radios closest to the demarcation point, because it's going to be aggregating your, 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 th your three hops, is going to be carrying the traffic from all the other hops. So on the further edge, you may use 20 megahertz channels. In the middle, you may use 40. And in the, in, in the closest ones, probably 80, because you're trying to put more traffic down, down, down the frequency. And so you need to extend your, um, 
you know, your frequency range. You could either do that by using wider channels in the same frequency, or, or what you could do is uh, you could do a different frequency, which uh, like, like a higher capacity link in a different frequency that maps it more towards the change of the wave. And so you have more changes and so it's more noise resilient. So maybe like 11 gigahertz or 60 gigahertz or something of that nature could, could be what you're doing. If you can't channel bond 80, 80 megahertz and five gigahertz. But that's a good question. Thank you for that. Okay, I have another question here. It says, uh, what handheld spectrum analyzer do you recommend? What frequency uh, spectrum? So that is, uh, that's a good question. Um, the handheld one, uh, here's the thing, for handheld ones, there is some, uh, I would say, I haven't found any ones that are very cost effective. Most of the time you have to hook up to your, uh, to your, um, to your laptop to get uh, at least one that's more cost effective. Uh, I had a, Air, a G2 Air, Air Check uh, from NetScout, that was about $2,400. That's okay. I mean, think of if you have, um, you don't have that much requirements. Uh, you don't need to view the full spectrum. You could kind of get away with that. It shows non-8211 and 8211 utilization at that time. Uh, you could record it and send it to yourself in the email. That's good if you're like in, in an area where you, know, you throw it in the truck, it could be bounced around. It could be used in environments in which you can't really use a laptop in or not ideal. It's just like, for example, when I was out there in, in Washington deploying those point to point links, it was they had freezing rain out there. And I use my air check because of it's much it's much more robust than my laptop. I don't really have my laptop around in freezing rain. So uh, I would say uh, probably might want to look into one of those. Uh, I would say uh, if you're getting one of those, also get one that does wired as well. The problem with that is that they, they increase the cost significantly. Uh, those are around eleven to twelve thousand dollars. So. Those tools are only good if you actually have going to have a good return on investment on it. If you're doing wireless on a regular basis, those are good for uh, for planning as well as uh, for for pre-deployment as well as after deployment for troubleshooting. For um, for more cost-effective tools, something like a um, like a like a MediGeek Insider, uh, either dual rainbowed uh, would be something I would take in take consideration. It has the price point is. It, the price point is, is, is kind of high here. The device is $500. The software is another $500. It's about $100 licensing fee a year. Uh, disclosure, I don't work for them. I don't have any recommendations. Like I don't get any kickbacks from them. So I'm not saying this just because uh, just because they, I'm getting any benefit from them monetarily. But uh, you know that would be something I would recommend for, for laptop application. Uh, then if you want to do a really good resolution one, you could do a, um, a, a sidekick. That one's a little bit more expensive. It's about two grand. With the software, it's about six grand total. With licensing, it gets up a little bit more. So as you can see, these things are not are not cheap. And uh, I would re uh, recommend researching or getting into one if you're actually uh, serious about troubleshooting and getting into actual planning appropriately. Because you could do a lot of cool things with that. You can actually pre-qualify an environment uh, to even tell whether or not real-time traffic will survive or not which is good because it saves you time from deploying and headaches of troubleshooting. You could just know right off the bat whether or not it's gonna be, uh, the application will be uh, applicable to the customer. And you could do mitigation techniques before you even uh, even know about it. For example, we had a, uh, a clinic that had a exit sign and it had a bad ballast in it. And we didn't know that. And they mounted the access point a little bit close to the exit sign and they wanted some roaming and they noticed they're having problems around that area. So we uh, moved the access point from the exit sign uh, like a couple feet, like three to like 10 feet. And that improved that. So that they were able to have a connection in the area now, but it changed the radiation pattern. So now they had to add another one on the other side of the doorway so they could actually get roaming. So in that case, if we had a spectrum analyzer before they deployed, we would actually see that the exit sign was actually outputting RF energy that would be negatively impacting. And we could automatically plan for two other access points to get around that. I've seen a lot of things uh, impact that. Most of the time, it's 80% of the Wi-Fi would be interference-related problems. OK, so that's a great question. Another question is, what other tool would you recommend beyond a frequency spectra, uh, spectrum analyzer? Well, uh, it would be uh, 811 protocol analyzer. Uh, I could do a webinar on some tools of the, uh, of the RF uh, engineer in a later, a later time. But uh, yeah, for the probably the best two tools you have is uh, is a spectrum analyzer and a 811 protocol analyzer. 
And those two would be all you need to determine, uh, you know, your Wi-Fi problems or your Wi-Fi health. Once you rule out the Wi-Fi, then you start to have to look into other things like application problems on your network, such as a DHCP scope that's too small. Maybe a DHCP helper is misconfigured. Maybe an application has a timeout and doesn't know what to do with the timeout. It's wigging out, and that, and that has nothing to do with the wireless. That'll be mostly having to do with the with the with the wired side and the application itself. So you could rule that out as, as well because Wi-Fi gets blamed for everything. Okay, that's a, also a great question too. Thank you for that. Okay, well, uh, that's a lot of great questions there. If any other questions, uh, you know, that I can get to, I'll email those people directly. And we're running low on time, so uh, thank you for for your time, and hopefully, look forward to you to the next uh, webinar.